I'm going to be talking about hormone therapy, which I guess we all know is a pretty, uh, a pretty established area, you would think, on one level. But I hope to challenge some of the ideas that you may have, depending on where you're coming at this. I have no disclosures. So defining success in 2017, what is successful therapy? Uh, cure, obviously, and cure is quality of life. In the old Sanda quality of life studies, one of the huge benefits of treatment was the sense you had taken care of your cancer. So treatment is its own, uh, provides this feeling. Quality of life, though, as med measured, you know, in the past 15 years, there may be more papers on quality of life than actual treatment modality improvements. So we're really tuned in that what I think is the successful formula now are what patients demand, what we should all be thinking about is cure with quality of life. And ADT impacts both. So the good, the bad, and the ugly of ADT, I think, we, we're kind of getting the drift from a lot of press releases and so forth, but the good is that we have an overall survival advantage with BEAM, and overall survival is a, a very high bar to, to meet. Um, remarkable local tumor responses. This is not talked about as much, but it's uh, uh, you know unbelievable on MRI, and I'll show you some of those. The bad, a litany of temporary side effects and maybe not so temporary, loss of libido, sexual dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction, 23% diagnosable mental illness, loss of muscle mass, metabolic syndrome. I would say polyarthritis syndrome I've seen in two men who literally had crippling total body polyarthritis until this wore off. And the ugly is cardiovascular death. That's getting a lot of attention, but it's a small subgroup of men in any study that have a risk set up for that. And there is a paper that says Alzheimer's, especially with long duration ADT, there's a higher risk of Alzheimer's. So that, that's the scary part. So let me present a success story, though, from my practice. 78-year-old man with high risk who is getting beam plus a plan two years of ADT. At six months follow-up, his PSA was undetectable. He had no complaints. He is a success story. And I told him, you're doing well. And then his wife piped up and said the following, Doctor, I've been married to this man for 50 years. In all those years, he never said an unkind word to me. In the past six months, he has taken my head off several times. He can be vicious. I don't even recognize this man. In all those years, if he walked through the room and I was sitting, I, he would always have some sign of affection for me. He'd say something or stroke me or something that said, you know, I love you. He is a very loving man, but in the last six months, he has never touched me. And then finally, uh, she said, there's a golf trip to Scottsdale every day year the family goes on. And the men talk about it for six months before and six months after. And this year, after almost 40-year tradition, he decided he didn't want to go. So I, I bring this up because I'm not sure. This guy wasn't, the irony here is, I didn't notice any difference. This man wasn't complaining. He was bearing this silently. I'm not sure we even have a metric for total personality change, um, especially when someone doesn't really mind it as much as their spouse does. But this is sort of that testosterone tenderizer that we were hearing about, like such an ironic picture of testosterone making you a very loving person as opposed to a, let's put it horny, let's put it that way. Uh, this was very interesting, but this is a tragedy. This is lethal quality of life. This is a disaster to ruin idyllic marriage of 50 years with a treatment that's going to have some effect down the road, but how quick is this going to reverse? So as we talk about ADT, though, I've got to take a step back first because the prognosis spectrum has been tweaked and how you, when and how you use ADT is sort of hangs on this grid. So I think the D'Amico intermediate risk and high risk categories have been dramatically changed. I would say now we recognize a favorable intermediate risk and unfavorable and then what I would call a high risk intermediate risk. Um, each one of these calls for a different uh, treatment. In high risk, I think we can split a favorable group, an unfavorable group, and now recently lethal prostate cancer as defined by several papers. So if you sort of sort your patients into these, you'll actually do a little bit better job. So we go to intermediate risk. What is favorable intermediate risk? It's one intermediate risk factor, Gleason 3 plus 4, or less than 50% biopsies positive. So uh, 
biopsy positivity is, is sort of added to the D'Amico in these schemes. Unfavorable, greater than one intermediate risk factor, Gleason 4 plus 3, or greater than 50% biopsies. Finally, the high risk category is not as well defined, but in every paper on intermediate risk cancer, they always say at the end, and oh, by the way, men who had three risk factors, or men who had three risk factors and more than 50% biopsies did terrible and needed more therapy, and D'Amico said, you know, these patients need an MRI to see if we can find high-grade disease, but many people are saying they need two years of hormone therapy. So if we look at the data on intermediate risk in hormone therapy, the Harvard study, it's, which is uh, amazing, the impact, but six months of hormones or none, and, and they kind of got a two-for-one here because they proved that in favorable intermediate risk patients, there was no benefit to hormones. So those patients do not need hormones. The unfavorable, there was actually a survival advantage to six months of hormones. And then if we go to the high risk, intermediate risk, again, D'Amico said these patients need an MRI to look for bad stuff, but we have a large uh, accumulation of patients treated with longer uh, androgen deprivation in the DART trial and ASCEND, and time will tell, but we're gonna have a big contingent of patients uh, who, who had longer uh, treatment. Now, DART did not split patients in intermediate risk into these categories, and, but interestingly, in the DART trial of six versus 24 months, it looked like intermediate risk patients with treated for 24 months benefited, not quite significant. It's going to end up being this bad group that benefits. So we look at high risk, favorable high risk, I would say is this old carryover from years ago where patients have said if you had one unfavorable risk factor, you were intermediate risk. This is like 20 years old, uh, just separating that group out. I think that's still a, a viable question. If you have one Gleason 8 chip and, uh, you know, if, if you go to one place, you're going to get 24 months of hormone therapy. Um, but I think this is a big, a big challenge. So unfavorable is just standard high risk. And then lethal high risk, I think, is the most important thing everyone in this room needs to understand. These papers are emerging in the last five years, Hamstra, Sandler, uh, and I was on the last one with combination. But if you have Gleason grade five at all, as Gleason nine, Gleason 10, or tertiary Gleason 5, you have lethal prostate cancer. And by lethal, it means you could die soon, not die in a 10 and 15 and 30 year time frame, but you are uh, threatened by this. It's a completely different entity. Parton has a 270 patient paper. You have to read this. It is so shocking and definitive on the limits of uh, of surgery in this group. He actually changed the Parton table. If you go to the Parton table now in the past and put in Gleason 8 through 10, that was the slot. Now he says Gleason 8 and 9 and 10. And the scary part about the Parton table now is if you say someone has a PSA of 4 to 6, just go through the Parton table, it's fascinating, 4 to 6 and a Gleason 9. So you think, wow, we found it. We found it early, right? Gleason 4 to 6, they just passed that threshold. About 50% of men in that category have prostate-confined disease. So we have to figure out a better way to find Gleason 5. But it's, uh, it's shocking how bad. And, and Parton said there's a very limited role for surgery in Gleason 9 and 10. I mean, very limited. So if we go to high risk, though, ADT and BEAM, then I think we have all these boxes stacked. The maize and blue means you have a prospective randomized trial to defend what you're doing. So um, if you look at this, we have the Harvard study for favorable, I think you could say six months for that favorable group. But if you look at all the large randomized trials, it's sort of short hormone therapy to longer hormone therapy, longer one every single time. So the EORTC, uh, I crossed out the six month, if you look at under the six month arm, I crossed out from DART, that arm did poorly. Uh, the only arm where longer was uh, not superior was in the uh, Spanish trial with too many letters and its numbers in its name, but it randomized to 36 versus 18 and found probable equivalence of 18 months. So otherwise, it's either 18, 24, or 36 months are needed and proven. I mean, and what's going to be shocking as we move to the breaky is how how unsubstantial our our proof is. But 
I would say for lethal high-risk prostate cancer, you should not treat this with beam and 24 months or 36 months or anything. It is a different entity. Why would I say that? Well, there's going to be a litany of papers like this coming out. This is from Keyshawn and a, a group that put together patients with 9 and 10. This is METS-free survival at 10 years. The combination group that had only eight months of hormones, so really tune in to the ADT that got them where they needed to go. Eight months of ADT, 91% at 10 years were met free in this really lethal cancer. Only 60% with beam, and they had 24 months of ADT. There, the other arm there is surgery. Surgery usually tracks with beam. Okay, I mean, we have all these papers where surgery is a little bit better than beam, but they're very select high-risk patients. But, 30, uh, but surgery was 30 points behind in this group as well. Um, if we look at the University of Michigan experience with combination versus beam in this group, this is prostate cancer-specific death. So look at six years. At six years, 30% of the beam patients were dead from prostate cancer. Less than 10% were dead if they went on combination ADT. And again, that was shorter. Ours was about eight months as well. Uh, so a stunning difference. I think what we have to say about lethal prostate cancer is that it conforms to a sequential model of metastasis, not simultaneous. This is almost, this was result kind of blew my mind because I, like everyone else, said the horse is out of the barn with high risk. If you've got high risk cancer and it's beyond the prostate, then it's probably like breast cancer. It's probably everywhere else in the body. But that does not fit what we're seeing. What we're seeing is there's a sort of a sequential, and there's a really nice New England Journal paper on this and saying why we should screen for prostate cancer. But it's a sequential model uh, in all but a few. And there's a window of opportunity when intensive local therapy is life-saving. Lethal prostate cancer, though, must be ablated, not treated. I consider beam with hormone therapy uh, treatment. It's treatment. They do not require more ADT. They require verified dose escalation. And, and I'll come to a case in a minute what that means. It just means you have to do dosimetry. You have to do a good implant. You can't say, I'm giving you combination therapy. If you're not checking and proving the dose is there, and however you do that, uh, then you're not doing anyone a favor with this. But it, these are, you know, stun this is a, the most important thing in the past five years in my mind is the fact that lethal prostate cancer stays localized. We got a shot at it, and it can be definitively uh, cured with local therapy. I would never have guessed that. I had no idea that was happening as I was treating all these patients. So if we then go to ADT brachytherapy, you're going to see a really, a really big switch. Uh, but most who are used to giving 24 months of ADT have to reckon with the fact that you can cure high-risk cancer with short course. You can also cure high-risk cancer with no hormone therapy. I mean, this is still a bit shocking to everyone, but I think most doctors who do brachytherapy actually count one of the virtues of the brachy approach is that you don't need as much ADT. Um, and that's huge if you, if you are thinking cure and quality of life and not just cure at all costs or I don't care what this does to your life. Remember, remember that guy? That woman was telling me she wanted me to know we had, I had ruined her marriage she wants you to know you could, it was like this was this kind of um, intimate moment. And so we have to really count the cost if we're thinking about cure and quality of life. So here's the only randomized trial that gets at what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a radar trial, kind of a key slide, because it's one trial where they did three beam doses, low, medium, high. And then they have a combination arm with HDR and beam, so a, a very high uh, dose arm, kind of with that slash. And then they did six or 18 months. And if you see, 18 months is a big benefit for all the beam, all the beam doses, right? High dose, you know, you can see the 18 month did way better. As you get to the HDR, the combination group, though, there's almost no difference, right? I think they still said it's statistically significant, but by God, you're going to take 12 more months of a hormone therapy to get that little tweak. I don't, you know, I don't think so. But this is almost the summary slide for the whole business. If you have beam, if you have high risk disease, you need lots of hormones. If you have combination therapy, you do not. Here is the no hormone therapy trial I was talking about, and it literally says in the title, no benefit to hormone therapy in the pre if you do technically competent combination therapy. In fact, in this weird Twilight Zone paper, the patients who got ADT did worse. 
Now, everyone says, well, of course they did worse. They were worse cases. You put them on ADT because they were the bad ones, and then they did worse, and they fulfilled the prophecy. But uh, the interesting thing is, even when you match those with the worst of the worst, here they took patients who had three high-risk factors. So these are really, really bad high-risk prostate cancers. And those who got no hormone therapy at all did better. This is a, 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 kind of an amazing result at 10 years. Uh, freedom from METs is almost 84% in this group at 10 years without any hormones. So we all have to reckon with this of the power of combination to spare. Uh, but the ADT thing, I think, is, might, might be impossible to really comment on. How could ADT make things worse? Well, it could. You could synchronize cells in a non-sensitive phase. HDR comes along, and you've basically protected the cancer cells from lethality. So if we look at the intermediate risk for hormone therapy with brachy, uh, you don't have boxes stacked to the ceiling anymore. In fact, you have to get all the way to the high-risk group before you even need to think about hormone therapy. Merrick has done a paper, about five papers, where in rapid succession, he said it doesn't matter if you're 4 plus 3, it doesn't matter if you're more than 50% biopsies, it doesn't matter if you're T3, it doesn't matter if you have perineural infiltration. All the things that bought these guys the six-month hormone therapy doesn't matter at all if you do a good implant. So that kind of wipes away the need for that. You could also say even in this high-risk group, uh, probably limited, six months, Ascend is going to be an interesting data set because they have all these combination patients treated with 12 months of hormones and, co and combination. But we're going to figure it out, uh, but not today. <laughs> High risk, again, remember those six-month Lupron shots stacked to the ceiling within all those prospective randomized trials. Uh, here you see this six months, uh, the radar trial I talked about. You know, we cross out the 18-month in the radar trial versus the six months because the 18-month was, was no better if you did combination. So again, if we're talking about curing patients and quality of life at the same time, you're getting better cure rates with combination, and you're doing it with less hormone therapy. Finally, I'd say there was this sort of school. They don't identify themselves, but they're sort of out there. I hear them at meetings, and they basically say six and out. Six is maximum. We are, they're, they're almost leaning towards we only need four months, and we only really need four months for one indication. And that is if you have an MRI that shows massive amounts of disease outside the prostate, uh, because this is what happens when you have massive disease outside the prostate. You can see this, this disease is growing right out through uh, the, the pelvic muscles. This is as bad a prostate cancer as you'll ever find. After four months of ADT, it's back within range of a brachytherapy procedure. I've had several of these patients that I think are utterly hopeless that kind of just collapse down. Here's another. Um, this is all tumor, all the way down to the penile bulb and below. Crazy extension. And this is after four months of ADT. It's just, there's almost like this collapse of these tumors back into a range where we can think about giving aggressive local therapy. Uh, finally, this is a DCE that shows that same patient earlier. You can see the contrast enhancement. And, in, you know, interestingly, it's just, it's just gone. So, so I do think... Um, I do think we're learning some things that we never knew before, head to head. Uh, I would say uh, everyone used to think that ADT just saves bad, right, bad radiation. That's the, that's the thing that these trials, everyone thought the dose escalation and all the IGRT and IMRT was going to be the big, big advantage. There is no question anymore that with beam radiation, ADT is a much greater advantage than dose escalation. Uh, it's about a 20% advantage if you do ADT with beam. Uh, the dose escalation, like going from instead of 70 gray to 78 or 80 gray, is about 5%. Very modest. Um, so that's different. ADT is critical to outcomes with beam in any form of aggressive cancer. So you, you cannot treat high-grade cancer with beam without hormones. Um, it's just not even, it, it would be absolute malpractice. Um, the exception is old age and comorbidity where you have to think, but really and truly there are papers that say even in the old age and, co and comorbidity there's still a benefit. But combination plus limited ADT can accomplish more than ADT plus beam. 
There is no question about that. If you all, all you have to do is read the Ascend trial. There's a 20 point difference at nine years. So um, fortunately, it's going to turn out that uh, you know intensive local therapies really do help. So um, just to talk about the cure with quality of life, this is our Lancet Oncology paper from May 2016, where we use this functional anatomy approach. We map out all the variations in anatomy. And if you do that, if you map out the erectile tissues, if you map out the external sphincter and you avoid them, you can get spectacular results in quality of life at five years. What do I mean? Well, at five years, 90% of men self-report the ability to be sexually active after intense combination therapy with six months. There was no difference between combo beam and ADT as if you gave six months. At five years, 90% were controlled and 90% had a, a, a sexual activity. So humanity, uh, these are these moments, I think, that are so, the sort of pregnant pause in our practice when we're face-to-face, -face, like I was with that woman, that changed everything about my thinking about ADT. Um, it made me think we really have to ask questions, we have to know if we're destroying someone's life, and they might not tell us. I mean, this is a complicated area. But let's talk about a couple guys who are now read on the internet, they have bad cancer, and they say, uh, I don't think I want ADT. So first case, guy just got married, second marriage, and he's doing pretty well. They're doing pretty well, but sex is very important to him. And then he has this high-grade gleasonate tumor, but it's somehow, luckily for him, it's almost like the smiley and the frown mask at the party on the, on the wall. I mean, one side is loaded, one side has nothing. So I went through the whole thing with him, and I said, I would think six months of hormone therapy with combination would be worth it. He said, nope, sorry, and I didn't have any problem with it. But I can tell you, when I did his combination and checked, you, have, you realize we're kind of a little bit uh, off with our thinking with hormones. We, we sort of think, okay, if, I don't, if this isn't perfect, just perfect, the hormone therapy will sort of pull it in and we'll be okay. So again, if you, there is, it's a scary thing when you treat without that, without hormone therapy, kind of as cover. And he's done fine. He's five years out, undetectable. Uh, but my other guy is a patient who came in with high-grade tumor. And he had Gleason 9 hanging out the side of his gland, going into his seminal vesicle. And he also, we also had one of these conversations. And the conversation was, you know, doc, 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 please, I got a woman. You know? And... I've never had it like this before. You can't do this to me, like this, sort of like this rant. So um, I have a website with virtual, uh, with a uh, virtual support group where all these guys with prostate cancer get up. And this conversation, again, like that conversation with that woman, is sort of unforgettable. Doc, 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 please. So this is a summary of my talk. You can see all these prospective randomized trials with BEAM. And they all have those maize and blue boxes. But uh, it's not actually as impressive in results as the brachy arm here with a bunch of light blue and yellow colors that mean we've, we're kind of not sure. We don't have validation there. And then finally, the, the rebel group that goes six months only. But in summary, ADT is a critical tool in the treatment of high-risk prostate cancer, more important than dose-escalated RT. And we've, we can say that without any doubt less important than combination therapy. It is possible the dominant mechanism is local tumor response. Again, five years ago, there was only one paper that had this MR tumor horrendous, and then after hormones, gone. Um, we're just learning about this. And then finally, we should really limit ADT for all the reasons I specified uh, to, due to uh, for profound side effects and toxicities and long-term quality of life. Six months, remember in that study, our, Lancet, our, our patients had combination six months of hormone therapy at five years. None of them were different. Beam, combination, or hormone therapy all had excellent preservation. So it's a dose to these structures.